So I have to either do a yoga pose or play the harmonica, I would imagine. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be here all week. So thank you to the event organizers. They were absolutely persistent and annoying as heck for getting this done. So they got it done. Thank you. Um, and thanks to the sponsor, and thanks to, for the great venue, and to Stanford, and to MIT, and to VLAB, and anybody else who's helped put this together. Um, my name is Eric Wessoff. I'm the editor-in-chief of Green Tech Media. I have uh, eight or nine minutes, and I have 300 slides. So <laughs> stay with me. Um, I'm the editor-in-chief of Green Tech Media. We're a five-year-old um, news and energy analysis company. Um, we have 30 people, and I don't, we don't talk about this too much, but we are profitable, and uh, that makes us the only green tech company that's profitable. <laughs> um, I have a great job. Um, I get to speak to brilliant CEOs, investors, and researchers every day, and I get to write, uh, I get to make up quotes about what they, what they told me. Um, but it's a, an incredibly gratifying job, and I've written about 1,500 articles on green tech and a couple of hundred articles on energy storage, and I have a, a beginner's idea of what it takes to, uh, what the energy storage landscape is about. Um, so if you were going to build, I'm, I'm showing you a blank page, by the way. Um, this page intentionally left blank. Um, if you were to build a network, an energy network or a data network, you'd have sources, you'd have loads, and you'd likely, uh, you could, it's arguable, but you'd have storage on this idealized blank page network, simply because if you're making power um, in the current energy network, you have to use that power. And there's an organization called an ISO, an independent storage operator, or in California, it's the California ISO. They're a nonprofit, and their job is to um, KTLO to keep the lights on. And what they do is they have to make sure that the supply of natural gas, nuclear, and coal-powered plants is roughly approximately equal to the demand that's being placed on that system. Um, Steve Berberick, who's the CEO of, of the Cal ISO, uh, gave a speech recently. And, and he, he said, with, with energy storage, that whole supply-demand equation goes out the door, but he also said um, energy, about energy storage, he says it's good stuff, but it's expensive, and we have to find business cases. And that was what the Cal ISO guy said. And so I hope that we can leave here in an hour or so understanding a little bit more about how Steve Berberick at Cal ISO could understand how the business cases fit into this network. Um, so that's what, again, you would put energy storage and you would maybe put a lot of clean energy sources on this blank piece of paper um, network, but it, it's not a, a blank piece of paper for you to figure out what the source and what the load is. It's, it's a 150-year-old incumbent that runs on coal, natural gas, nuclear, and to a much, much, much lesser extent, wind, solar, geothermal, and a few renewables. Um, and for the foreseeable future, especially with the low price of natural gas, um, this is going to be the way the pie is sliced. Mostly coal, uh, natural gas ascendant, uh, nuclear at about 20% of our energy mix, um, and wind, solar, and other renewables making up the other piece. And as long as you're, you don't have a blank piece of paper, you have the world's greatest machine, the electrical grid, but it is not a blank piece of paper. It looks a lot like this. If not in the US, it looks like this in, in other nations. And so you can't just start, you're not building this anew. And that's the challenge faced by entrepreneurs in, in green tech and in energy storage, that they're not, they're not, they're not starting from a, a white space. So this is the audience participation portion of the program. What are the most prevalent storage technologies out there on the grid today? Anybody? <laughs> Pumped hydro, good. You got to speak in unison. And anything else? 
So the, the, the two, you got it right, pumped hydro and compressed air energy storage are the, the pre prevalent energy storage technologies on the grid at the moment. And there's um, hundreds of megawatts of compressed air energy storage, which is essentially finding a abandoned salt cavern or natural gas storage area and pumping air into it. Um, or with pumped hydro, it's pumping water up a hill and pumping water down a hill when you, when you need the energy from that, from, from that, from that uh, previously pumped water. Uh, that's unfortunately, when you're talking about compressed air energy storage, it's geographically destined. You, you, can't, you have to have a big reservoir low and a big reservoir high. Utilities like it because it lasts for 50 to 80 years and has a very, very predictable operations and maintenance. It's a big hole in the ground. It's something easy to maintain. Um, just, uh, we, we actually, we, we dodged the bullet of having the CEO of this company on uh, the panel. It's a company called Gravity Power, and they drill a, an enormous hole in the ground. It's about 6,000 feet deep, and they fill it with water, and they seal it with a technology yet Un undiscovered, um, and they fill it with water from a source as yet undiscovered. Um, but it is also a variation of uh, pumped hydro, and you'll see that this is a, um, an artist's rendering, and in fact, um, the major employment opportunities in energy storage at the grid level today are in artist's renderings. <laughs> so I was, I was asked to um, provide a little bit of the technology that's out there and some of the players, and, and this is absolutely just a partial list. But these are some of the storage technologies that are available. We talked about pumped hydro. There's 120 gigawatts of, of capacity worldwide in pumped hydro. In compressed air energy storage, we have light sail energy, um, who uh, is a, a Kosla Teal Gates Innovacom, Innovacorp funded. Um, startup doing some very interesting alternates on, on CAES. But um, one of our, spe the speaker tonight, uh, Jay Whitaker from Aquion, uh, is in the electrochemical energy storage. And that takes into account batteries, flow batteries, perhaps fuel cells if you want to call them energy storage. It's arguable and we're not gonna argue just yet. Um, another interesting battery company in this VC funded uh, grid storage world is Ambry which is formerly, I, I need to give, uh, throw out a little love for MIT. It's, a form, it's formerly known as Liquid Metal Battery Company. It's a technology founded by uh, uh, Don Sadaway. Um, and it's, a, it's also a brilliant big idea. And it's also funded by uh, Bill Gates and Vinod Khosla, I believe. Um, so there's hundreds of millions of dollars invested by venture capitalists in energy storage. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, most of it has gone into uh, artists' rendering so far. Um, there are a lot of other technologies, whether they be storing hydrogen, there's thermal storage that's currently used in uh, CSP, compressed, uh, sorry, concentrated solar, solar power, like companies like uh, Bright Source Energy or Solar Reserve, and a, a number of other interesting new technologies out there, and, and I only have a few minutes to talk, so I will keep going. Each technology, each chemistry has its own <sighs> Um, output, discharge, and power profile, and you, you may see these charts. In fact, it's by law, if you're presenting on energy storage, you have to show this chart. By law, if you're presenting on energy storage, you have to show this chart. But what's important is, are, are you, do you have this? Because that's, yeah. okay, all right. Um, what's important is that energy storage is not some monolithic application. There's a lot of different types of energy storage. Um, ranging from power quality, uh, power um, voltage regulation. You have to keep the uh, grid humming, uh, I, I should know this offhand, uh, between 59.6 hertz and 60.1 60 hertz in California. And bad things happen if you don't. And there's a whole market of keeping that frequency at that level. So um, the bottom left is power quality and reliability. And the, the Technology or the, the application that's always talked about is commodity storage, meaning when the sun is shining, you um, either use that energy or store it away. When the wind is blowing, you use that energy or you store it away, and you, you, you dispatch that power when it's needed or when it's um, more expensive to do. Um, anyway, these, these charts are, are stolen from the American Energy Storage Association 
or something like that. Um, I, I'm very, very precise about referencing my sources as a journalist, as you can see. Um, also by law, I have to show these two charts. This is a typical solar output from a solar farm on 10 second resolutions, and every time that those, that output is plummeting, there's a cloud coming in the way. And if you are going back to that ISO, that independent service operator, this causes you, you to enormous amounts of pain when you see this because you have to have a backup for this. You can't just lose all your solar power and not have a way to back it up. And typically that backup is done um, with a natural gas peaker plant. This is uh, unpredict unpredictable wind. Um, I don't know how this picture got in here, but the predominant electrochemical um, method for energy storage today are sodium sulfur, NAS batteries, uh, typically from NGK. And this is uh, an example of one that's uh, not currently uh, in flame. And uh, th that's, that's uh, libelous. They, they've shipped hundreds of megawatts, uh, mostly to Japan, right? But this is a standard large scale utility scale battery and it's expensive. And gentlemen on this panel are looking for applications and ways to lower the cost of these types of batteries. Um, California has a 30% renewable portfolio standard um, by 33 by 2020, 33 by 2033, some arbitrary number picked by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, but a really good question is, can we get to 33% renewables without energy, renewable, without energy resources on the grid? I, I wanted to give you a, a list of uh, profitable utility scale energy storage companies. Okay. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, energy storage business plans, because when Jay Whitaker, when Steve Crane were looking at how to make this company, they had, to, they had to decide whether they were a technology company or a services company. Were they selling batteries or were they selling um, megawatt hours, right? Um, we've watched with not great results a flywheel company called Beacon Power, who was originally a hardware company, eventually went into selling uh, megawatt seconds or watt seconds into the frequency regulation market and they, they went under and they went bankrupt. But the other question is, uh, are you gonna sell to utilities or are you gonna sell to users? I have two minutes, I can do that. Um, I heard yesterday, if you have a business plan and it involves Congress, it's a stupid business plan, okay? And I would propose that if you have a business plan and it involves selling utilities, you also might have a, you have a difficult, I won't use the word stupid, uh, you have a challenging business plan. You're free to counter what I've said here. Um, or do you want to sell into adjacent markets? And, and Abe Yokel, uh, the VC on this panel, has a, a portfolio company who kind of fits that, that um, title. The other thing I wanted to talk about is we, as a Silicon, a Silicon Valley denizens and venture capitalists and entrepreneurs, we, we are in love with technology and we think that the answers to many of our problems lie in the periodic table. And I would suggest that the tables that we really need to be at are in Washington or at the CPUC or at the FERC, forgive me, um, and, and at lawmakers. I would suggest, and, and I'm, I'm putting this out there for the, the CEOs to savage, that if you had energy storage today at zero dollars per watt and you brought it to a utility and said, here is my zero dollar per watt battery, they would say, thank you very much. What the heck do I do with this? They don't, because energy storage has not been a traditional part of the network, it doesn't, it's not load, it's not transmission, it's not generation, it's something else, and it doesn't fit neatly into their regulatory world view. And so uh, I, would, I, would, I, I think that some of the challenges, and, and Abe, I'd love to hear about how you view, when you, when you fund a, a startup, how do you deal with the regulatory un risk that you're, you're dealing with? I'd like, I'd like to, hope, hopefully you'll address that. Um, and so I, I've been doing this for about eight years, and I, I, I myself have tried to lay off using the word holy grail game changer or linchpin. Um, but that's the, the, the terms that are typically used with energy storage. And I would say that 
none of that is true. By the way, this is not a whole, the Holy Grail is on the left, and that is the, does anybody know what that is on the right? That is the holy hand grenade, excellent, excellent. <laughs> So you spent, I know where you've, your misspent youth has been. In, um, anyway, so I would suggest that energy storage, when it becomes affordable and when it fits regulatorily into our system, is just another tool in, in, that, in that energy mix that we have. Um, and so I, I have a tendency to be less than optimistic. Um, that's mostly because I, I spend a lot of time getting fibbed to by press releases and PR people and CEOs. Um, but I am optimistic, and I think we do have a bit of a blank page. And that blank page is being written by entrepreneurs in the audience. We have a bunch of solar en uh, energy storage CEOs in the audience. We have a bunch of energy storage CEOs on, on, on the uh, panel. And we have a lot of young, smart people in the audience. And, these are the people who are going to be filling in this blank page and creating, hopefully, um, an electrical network that does not look like today's electrical network, that's agile, that's smart, um, and clean. So I think that does it for me. Um, I'm very easy to find, Um Does anybody familiar with greentechmedia.com? All right, that's relatively good answer, good answer. Um, Read that, okay? Thank you. I have to start. Forgive, forgive my, forgive my plug. Um, and so the structure today is we're going to hear from Jay Whitaker at uh, from, he's the uh, CTO and founder of Aquion Energy, a int very interesting battery company. And um, and then we'll go through the rest of the panelists. So I thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for your time, and let's get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I also want to inform you that it is not cold outside. Uh, from Pennsylvania, uh, we come, and it's uh, much colder there, for sure. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to see this many folks a in a room uh, eager to learn and see more about storage. I'm not convinced that it would be nearly this big even a handful of years ago. Um, it speaks a lot to what's going on out here, um, how important this is becoming, and, and how there's a lot of vision about, about what this could be. So, Aquan Energy, uh, this is our mission. We want to change the world uh, the way uh, through delivering uh, a different kind of product that is going to allow a variety of new technologies, not just grid scale and not North American grid. And one of the things I want to, to, to throw out there before I even get started is that the energy storage question, uh, we don't believe, is answered right away by addressing a large grid problem. The, the grid, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, um, is not quite ready for storage. And so, but there are a lot of places that are ready for storage. And so we are going to embark on this miss mission uh, by attacking those first. And I want to tell you a little bit about, about how we're going to do that. Uh, so we have to expand existing markets and enable new markets. You can read the rest of these. Um, we have to be fast. We have to look at global issues. Where are the pain points right now? Where can we do smaller things and grow them? Where can we put products or prototypes out right now to learn from? Um, we, and how do we develop something that has a minimal technical risk and a minimal economic risk, and that will allow us to reach convergence with a product now and later, have a good, uh, a good path to something that's going to be sustainable, right? Uh, and we have to do this with not very much money. Venture cap uh, is very, even now, different than it was six months ago from a funding perspective. It's not easy to raise money doing green technology. In fact, we're uh, looking to recast ourselves as a straight energy technology company. It's not easy to, uh, to look at the string of issues that have happened in the green tech world the past year and go in with a straight face and ask for 40 or $50 million and say, yeah, this is going to work perfectly. Um, people don't buy it, and maybe for good reason. So we have to be as lean as possible. Um, and those people who are going to fund us, um, they've got to be tolerant to more risk uh, longer, longer term before they get any payback. Um, and they have to be willing to write a check and then maybe even a bigger check later on, uh, one or two shots on goal for, for us, perhaps. And so it's not an easy question to ask. And we are hopefully arriving at something that uh, very soon is going to be at least uh, a first sortie out there. So the company history, 
started in 2007 in my lab at, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and there were a couple principles that we were trying to follow. First, we only use ubiquitous and inexpensive materials uh, that are easily manufacturable. And all decisions from the very first day were made through the, the view of key product metrics. If I take this material and I put it into a device, will it do what it's supposed to do? Uh, at a, from a cost perspective, a manufacturability perspective, and a performance perspective. If not, you set it aside immediately. Do not play with things that are not going to take you to where you want to go. Um, we also developed this notion of fast materials innovation. It's a mix of concurrent engineering, uh, risk hedging, um, doing things quickly, failing fast, and, and understanding and using intuition to get to key proof of concept as fast as possible. So in the spring 2008, the first prototype what was de uh, developed at CMU is a little tiny coin cell. It had a, a smidget of uh, manganese oxide um, and some activated carbon and some cotton and some salt water. Uh, sodium ion battery uses dirt and cotton. Uh, Kleiner Perkins liked that idea. Uh, and they, uh, we did an incubation at Carnegie Mellon, which is kind of unusual. They were willing to put money in a bank account and then fund me as a professor at CMU. Uh, one of the uh, partners there was actually the acting CEO. And we really had no employees for the first 18 months. And that was a, um, a, a fantastic experience. They were technically involved. They brought a lot of different people to bear. And it was surprising to me. I had a very different perception of what working with the VC was going to be like. And they were incredibly supportive. Uh, and then in summer 2009, Ted Wiley became our, our first employee. He's a, a very brave soul. He uh, left business school and moved to Pittsburgh and just dug in. And we grew from there. Uh, we have over 100 people now. Uh, we set up a pilot line last year. It's functional. Uh, and our manufacturing line will come online next year. It's been a very, very fast growth spurt. Uh, the key to this is that when we left CMU, we basically had the material system locked down. It was a matter of taking it to something that was scalable. So what is the technology? Uh, it has to be simple. It has to be scalable. It needs a minimal amount of processing. Um, the anode, so what's a battery? Electrochemical battery. It's got some electrodes, right? The plus and minus. Uh, the minus in our case is activated carbon. Uh, the plus is a manganese oxide material. And that X is, is an alkali ion. It can do a variety of, of species. Sodium is the least expensive, but there's lithium and potassium as well. Um, but it doesn't stop there. You have to have current collectors that allow to translate the electrons in and out of the system. There's some packaging. The uh, electrolyte is just sodium sulfate and water and salt water. Uh, it's neutral pH. It's not caustic. Um, you literally can, can eat this material. It's, there's nothing really terribly hazardous or toxic about it. Um, when you charge the battery, the ions all go to the, the anode side. When you discharge it, they all go to the cathode side. And the electrons are shuttling back and forth on the outside. So it, it's, and I could go in much more detail, but I don't have time. Uh, but it operates very much like a lithium ion battery, except you have water and very inexpensive materials. Uh, but to go from this simple idea, which is basically what we had at CMU, to a product, it took an awful lot of time and a lot of very good engineers. This is a uh, cutaway of our product. This is a, a beta. Uh, a unit that we are now manufacturing and prototype. It has four cavities. Each cavity has 16 layers of four by four electrodes. These are what the electrodes look like. They're about two by two inch pellets. Um, they are stacked up in 16 layers in each one of those cavities. This is sort of a cutaway of those electrodes. Um, this is a, a unit that has been uh, filled with electrolyte, is ready to go, but it's not ready yet. Uh, they don't work standalone. We actually put them into stacks of units with plates on them. And this is not an artist rendering, I will tell you, it's legitimate. Um, this is a uh, 12 or 13 kilowatt hour uh, uh, unit uh, that has been on test for a while. We're running act, uh, you know, application specific duty profiles on it, showing how it works, uh, gathering data. This is our alpha unit. Our betas are gray. They look a bit more professional. They don't have sort of these big bolts sticking out of them. Still kind of Frankenstein-y, agreed, but real, not artistic. Um, so what makes this battery different? Uh, very low materials cost, I've already emphasized that. Modular, and I think this is what differentiates us from a lot of other grid scale storage, is that it can be as small as one kilowatt hour, and it can go up to as, as large as you want to go. Having that modularity allows us to put many prototypes out there, even now, to get data. Um, and we are investing money in manufacturing, not very expensive demonstrations. So this helps us get to a more rapid innovation cycle. Um, it's durable. We've demonstrated many, many thousands of cycles on thin electrode coin cells and over a thousand cycles on real thick elect electrode prototypes. And I can get into that later if there's questions. But uh, we believe we can, we can show a path to 10 years of stable performance right now. 20 years is the goal. 
Um, broad temperature range stability, also important, not flammable not flammable, will not burn. Uh, there's been a fair amount of, of publicity. A couple different battery companies have had some issues recently. We don't have those. Um, and environmentally benign, again, salt water, dirt, um, carbon, a little bit of stainless steel and a polypropylene case, uh, not so bad. So uh, our thesis, uh, what, what do you not see? You do not see energy density here. Um, you do not see uh, specific energy. Uh, and the idea is that if it's energy dense enough, and enough depends greatly on where you're putting it, you don't need to be any better. And in fact, it's cost that matters. And density gets you by way of cost, mainly when you're in this world. Uh, so this is where we are focused on density, increasing it over uh, the path of our, you know, our technology development path, but it's not necessary right now. So, and we can talk about that too. Um, manufacturing, so we have always, we've been designing for manufacturability from the onset. And uh, just, I've got a couple of videos here just to give you a sense of sort of, oh, you know, right from the beginning, our stuff is um, coming off the line. This is a, uh, a pellet press, and these are our electrodes. They come off in hundreds a minute. And if you don't know much about green body manufacturing, it's actually kind of a, a work of art to make that many electrodes that quickly. Uh, and that's just from a food processing kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of, it's important. Um, this is a, early 2011, we, we made batteries, these are very small prototypes. Um, it's a 10 person dial table, all by hand. E each person had a layer, a cathode, anode, separator, current collector, and each person is putting in their thing and, and it would take a half a day or a day to build a very small number of batteries. <laughs> all right, so anyway, that picture is, it, it, it's, a, it's a little robot arm with suction cups and it picks up the layers and puts it inside the case. And the first half of that video is the very slow version in our, in our prototype plant. The second uh, video is a much faster version. We have uh, some equipment that's actually on the ocean right now coming to our manufacturing plant in Pittsburgh that will do three of our units a minute, and it's a very rapid pick and place process. It's really exciting to see. So we've come from little tiny coin cells through the electrode manufacturing process to this rapid sort of manufacturability, and it's all from off-the-shelf manufacturing technologies, and it's uh, been conceived from the beginning to be as such. So that's an important lesson, I think, that, that we try to embrace right away. If you can't think about how you're going to do it on day one, you might not ever solve it. So products and markets. So I've already showed you the cutaway from this unit right here. Um, they go in these stacks of seven. It's roughly uh, just over a kilowatt hour, uh, about 48 volts bus voltage. And these go um, as individuals, or they can go in uh, modules that we, uh, groups of 12, right? They can go inside containers or even very high voltage arrays. And as you increase size, we have different markets that we address with them. And these are sort of the four main markets. And we break this up into sort of um, specific kinds of technology markets, and we also call them more generally simple and complex systems. Um, the first one is lead acid battery replacement. You can easily imagine in a lot of cases you've got polypropylene case lead acid or our battery. They could more or less be swapped one for one. You may have to have some electronics modification for your inverter technology. It's not a terrible thing, and you can imagine doing it. Um, there's off-grid and renewable generators. Uh, diesel is expensive in many parts of the world to the extent that photovoltaics and batteries make sense, even with lead acid. And we do much better than lead acid from a cost perspective because of our lifetime and our thermal, uh, our thermal stability. So there's a lot to be said uh, about this, this intermediate size. And this is probably where we're going to do a lot of our early sales. Um, Microgrids are a bit larger. Uh, we're talking about hundreds or even uh, thousands of kilowatt hours in, in different locations to support villages, schools, uh, islands, places like this, even small grid time projects where, uh, or military projects where, where the money counts. Then there's the grid scale services. And generally, uh, as we increase size, we also uh, are willing to wait longer to in certain of these markets. So you want to focus early on in the smaller lead acid replacement and off-grid renewable generation. Uh, Learn your hard lessons, get feedback from customers, make sure that the projects you're doing have the same kinds of use cases and duty cycles that microgrids and grid scale are going to have. Use those learnings for your next generation of product and then sell to the grid. Um, this is kind of how we're viewing our process right now. Um, and, and Ted's in the audience, please, please come talk to him. Afterwards, he's making a lot of progress getting customers lined up, sending out uh, prototypes, getting feedback already. Voice of the customer discovery is very important. And we are still evolving what these modules actually look like. We don't know. These are artist renderings, by the way. Um, uh, although we do have real ones, too, but they're not pictures. So and, uh, some money went to that naturally. Um, anyway, so this is my last slide. And this is um, uh, the organizers just wanted some advice. Like, what was it that allowed us to get to where we are right now? Uh, 
avoid pathological innovator syndrome. And I see this a lot in, in especially energy things. Uh, you end up all drinking the same Kool-Aid, and if you can't, you can't just believe in what you have. You have to have solid data that shows exactly point A to point B, this is what we have, and you have to be able to convince yourself. It's not too hard to convince funders sometimes, and in fact, they really want to believe you a lot of times. You have to make sure that you're responsible enough to, to not oversell what you have, make it real. Um, and the other thing is, is commercial launch always takes longer than you think, so make that real too. Understand what the time horizon really is, and remember that things are going to go wrong, and you have to be, pre be prepared for that. Uh, as you are starting out with your very first prototypes, you have to get to a practical demonstration as quickly as possible. This is critical for showing that you have something that is real, and it's critical for the health of the business. Um, we have this phrase, the company, paint without tape, and you always paint without tape early on. Uh, this goes back to when you're painting walls and you, you can either take the extra half an hour or an hour to put the masking tape up to really define things, or if you're careful with your hand, you can almost do it just right. That's what we do every single time. And sometimes you make a horrible disaster, it's a mess, you have to repaint the room, it's crazy. But if you do it every time, your net wins are gonna outrule or over, overrule your net losses. And if you're consistent and disciplined about it, you're gonna have more chance at innovating more quickly. Um, partner with the right companies at the right times. So we've been talking about this recently a lot. Uh, early adopter customers or customers that have a high threshold for risk or they, have a less, they are less resolved in how they analyze product or your product are great to talk to early on. Uh, we spent some time very early on talking to big name companies, trying to get their feedback and, and it turns out that that was um, maybe time le better spent with people who were earlier in the supply chain or were able to go out and happy to tinker with the stuff. The folks that we're most happy with right now, partner-wise, are tinkerers, people who really like to rip things apart. They throw up demonstrations. They try to do abuse cases, and they get back to us. It's, that's been much more valuable. Um, and as a founder, uh, if you're in energy or anything that's, that's manufacturing or hardware is focused, be prepared to give up your ownership. Um, and it's a simple sentence. A small number of shares in a company with a world-class team of investors and great leadership building something really good is worth a lot more than a lot of shares in a company that you're trying to maintain control of. It's, it, there's just too much money and too many moving parts for something that's hardware related like this. So uh, early on, uh, in fact, immediately, I, I ceded control of the company uh, to people who I trusted. And I think that's made a real difference. Uh, and the last thing, and I'd like to talk with, with some of the, uh, the other folks who are in the audience and here who have other battery companies. I think secrecy is overrated if our markets are not well-defined yet. Uh, we should help each other. We should be cutting the ice together to define a huge market that we then can all sell into, and competition really ought to be a long ways away. So anyway, that's my, that's my spiel, and uh, I guess I'll see you to the next speaker. Just uh, stay up here for a couple of seconds, and let me ask you a, a, a quick question. Um, you're funded by Kleiner, and, and who else? Uh, found, found Foundation. Foundation Capital, Bilderbergers, and the Illuminati? And ATV. Okay, yes. ATV? Yes, those are our three VCs. Okay. We've got, uh, we had five million in, in DOE money, and we have State of Pennsylvania money, and we have some other federal loans coming down the pike, and so, and we're, we'll, we're looking to close another round sometime soon as well. Well, you have 100, so. peop 100 people you're yes, working with. Yes, the burn right? rate is no joke. Understood. Yeah. Um, how long did it take from um, knocking on Kleiner's uh, Plane yeah, to yeah. Um, uh, closing closing a round. Uh, the the seed round was about eight weeks. Wow. Um, yeah, it was really. Like and that, Bill Joy, Bill Joy was in, yeah, boom. It's fast. Yeah, Bill Joy is in my office at CMU about a week after I had I had a previous interaction with them. We were talking for a while, and when I said I had something, they came right out. It was actually okay. and is Bill fast. Joy is Bill Joy on your board? He started out and he seeded to Ray Lane, so now Ray is on our board. Okay. Um. One last question. You mentioned that uh, ener energy density, spe spe uh, specific, den uh, specific density, is not as important now. But if you're going after automotive mm -hmm. or critical small pr footprint type of stuff, it's very critical. Mm -hmm. So. Are, have you dispensed, have you said, we're not going after yeah. anything that has a, a real estate issue? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So you seed density for cost and durability. 
Uh, I mean, the, the bad news is that we're not very energy dense. The good news is that we're not very energy dense. So we've got a lot of thermal mass. It's hard to heat us up. It's hard to cool us down. Um, we're tolerant to a lot of other kind of physical abuse cases that, that more energy dense batteries would have a harder time with. I mean, there's an awful lot of energy in a lithium ion battery. Uh, it's more hazardous for that reason. So there's a real trade off. And if you are cost effective and less dense, that's the key, right? I mean, density and cost are related to some extent. If you can overcome that inflection point, I think you're better off for stationary only. Okay. okay. Um, all right, good. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So, so wh while, while, um, while I and you were uh, wasting our youth watching Monty Python, um, Steve Crane was busy getting research grants at age 13. Um, were you watching Monty Python as well? Of course. OK. <laughs> um, and um, I'd li this, typically, the structure at VLab events, um, which we're willing to, now that oh, I have the microphone, we can, we can kidnap as much as we want. But um, I'd like to hear from you, Steve, on, on light sail. You have six to eight minutes, or as much as you'd like to take. You can stand up here. You can do it from there. Why don't you, why don't you take the lectern? Actually, I can be briefer, because if I had slides, my last one would have been exactly the same one that Jay had, with all the, with all the same points. Uh, well, let's see. Did, did anybody see the uh, cover of Bloomberg Business Week last week? Uh, it had a picture of like the, some flooded uh, part of the East Coast and the really big headline. Anybody see it? It said, what did it say? It's, gl it's global warming, stupid, is what it said, yeah. Uh, so sure, you want to look at the markets, but start with the problem, OK? And this is a pretty big problem. Uh, and, and you know, I think, talk about drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, it's kind of time that, that everybody, everybody you know, sort of faced up to it. Uh, and the good news is I think it's solvable, and we can make you know, uh, great businesses out of doing so. Uh, so I'm glad you mentioned, Eric, the um, gentleman's name, who I've now forgotten, the head of the Cal ISO? Steve Steve, yeah, well, okay, that's probably why I forgot it. So, okay. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so he said, uh, apparently, uh, that, you know, energy storage is expensive. Let's find some business cases that make it work. And oh my goodness, how are we going to get to, you know, 33% renewable penetration with this expensive energy storage, and there's actually a bill in uh, California uh, that, that, that requires a certain amount of energy storage capacity on the grid. However, that's, that requires the price point being somewhere that it makes it, it, makes it economical for the utilities. Uh, so it's all about this price point thing. And I would turn that question around. And so I, I, it was, I, I'm very interested to hear him say that. It's expensive. We need to find some business cases where it's, where it's going to work. Uh, I would say, well, what price does it need to be at in order to solve this problem. Uh, so we, my, 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 my co-founder and I, who's in the audience, uh, Danielle Fong, who came from the uh, uh, Princeton Plasma uh, Physics Research Lab, uh, was, was, was looking at uh, trying to create fusion energy, uh, which certainly seems like it would solve that problem. Uh, but it seemed to be taking far too long to do it with that approach. Uh, and there's something about energy storage that just kind of gets to people, or at least gets to engineers. Uh, and it just seems like it should be so easy, right? Uh, you know, you could have a big spring or, and sorry, I don't know if there are any representatives of some of these companies in the audience, but there, there, there are some fairly loopy ones out there. My, my, I'm not sure which is my favorite, the giant undersea air bladders, or the, the one where you've got a ski lift that's carrying gravel to the top of, of, a, of a mountain. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sorry, I, uh, I, probably just as well. I mean, that's one they say, like to say, it's, well, you, I, I know it sounds crazy. Well, it kind of actually, it actually is. Uh, or, you know, I could be fooled by this, and it's great. I'm glad people are thinking about every possible way. Their, their flywheels, as you mentioned, beacon powered, but they had these really high-tech flywheels. They're people that are doing very cheap you know, giant steel flywheels. Uh, there's you know, the pumped hydro, which is a form of mechanical storage. All, I don't know how many different battery chemistries. There's a website uh, that, that we found recently that listed, I think, 140 different battery chemistries. And I think almost all of them are being funded somewhere in the world. Uh, and, you know, a, a, bunch of other, a bunch of other approaches uh, that, that 
And people just love to think about this problem. Uh, but the question we asked was, look, we have to provide gigawatt hours of storage, right, in order to make the grid rational. And I think the problem was that, you know, I, I think Eric sort of brought the main point up, which was that when we started out, uh, we didn't have, you know, building the grid, we did not have any form of energy storage, but we needed the grid. So somehow we, you know, made it all work uh, with, with generation uh, and transmission and all and, and, and so forth, but with no storage. Uh, and, you know, I like to think about, and I guess this happens in many parts of the world, that, you know, when you flip the light switch on in your bathroom in the morning when you get up, somebody somewhere has to be cranking up uh, you know, a gas turbine or something in order to meet that, in order to meet that demand. It's not quite that bad, but it almost is. And imagine if, you know, the water distribution system worked that way, didn't have reservoirs or catchment basins or flood control or anything like that. It would, you know, somebody would have to be seeding the clouds every time you wanted to take a shower. It's, it's the fact that the energy grid works at all is astounding, but it clearly can't work that way forever. And it's hard to imagine that this is the lowest cost approach to building an energy grid. And there are places that are building huge energy grids as we speak in China, India, South Asia, uh, you know, and other places as well, I'm sure will soon be happening in, in, you know, in Africa and, and, other, and, South, and parts of South America and so forth. So we do have a chance to get this right. And the scope of the opportunity, as the number of people in this room makes obvious, is, you know, is, is utterly enormous. But what is that problem? The problem, I think, is the cost. So uh, we have to, you know, if, if all the people in the energy grid space are in the mindset thinking like, well, we have to find some way to justify the use of energy storage because it's so expensive. Like I say, turn the problem around. What is the cost? Well, a lot of people have done these computations. Uh, you know, what would it take, for example, let's say you were comparing, you wanted to add your, in, northern India or something like that, uh, you're in charge of adding 500 you know, a gigawatt, half a gigawatt or something like that of new capacity uh, on the grid. Uh, today, you would do it by a mix of base load plants, and it could be nuclear, it could be coal, it could be uh, combined cycle uh, uh, gas, and the US would be the, last, the latter because gas is so cheap. In other parts of the world, gas is more expensive, so you might go with coal if that's available, but whatever, you're gonna have some mix of base load and then some, some number of peakers, maybe on the order of 20% of the power will be created by peakers. Uh, and so that's, the, you know, putting a system like that together and then having it deliver power has got a certain, a certain cost uh, per kilowatt hour and, you know, there's some profit in the utilities and all that sort of stuff, but it's, it's, you know, 10 cents, 12 cents. I mean, it depends very much where you are. But with modern technology, it's something like that. So what you need to be able to do to fix the problem, to build a trillion dollar business, and it really is possible to build a trillion dollar business here, uh, is to figure out how to take renewables plus storage and deliver power for the same price. Uh, and you know what, you're never gonna, uh, Danielle feels differently, I feel, you'll probably never get rid of all of fossil fuel. But right now, fossil fuel is, is responsible for, I don't know, I don't have the exact number on the tip of my finger, but something like 70% of all energy generation if you include um, transportation and, and, ele and electrical generation. And we need to take it to, from 70% to 10% or something like that to, 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 to really make the planet work. Uh, and okay, uh, so we need to do that, we understand that. The political will isn't there, maybe the money isn't there. Let's figure out how to do the right thing cheaper. So let's figure out how to take you know, renewables plus storage and, and deliver kilowatt hours for 10 cents. Uh, well, we need to do a little better with renewables. Uh, they're, they're maybe now kind of roughly at that point, but they're intermittent. And I was actually talking to the, to, uh, the, the main economist at a, at a large wind, uh, you know, wind developer. And he, he had this very succinct phrase, which is, yeah, you know, we at this wind company uh, sell intermittent power, but that's not what people wanna buy. You know, people want power to meet their demand. Uh, so we need to get, you know, the, the, my, my, my sense is if, if uh, solar is now at maybe $1.40 a watt, something like that, uh, installed, uh, in the best circumstances, uh, not the most efficient, uh, wind is maybe, what, $1.60, $1.70, something like that a watt, we need to get those numbers down, not a huge amount, a bit, maybe to $1.10, something like that. And then the rest of it has got to come from storage. It's got to, storage has got to be, roughly a dollar a watt. Uh, and that's for a watt of power delivery and a lot of hours of capacity. And that's the hard part. So probably, 
you know, the, the typical, the grid is like running at 60% capacity. So, you know, if you, if you looked at what it could deliver, if it was, you know, fully running at peak all the time, what really gets delivered is about 60% of that. So you're looking therefore at, uh, you know, in a typical day, 14, 15 kilowatt hours for that kilowatt uh, of power generation. Uh, and so you need to deliver that energy storage for that, you know, for, for, for roughly a dollar, the, the, the power part and the energy part. So that's what we set out to do. Um, I don't know how much time I've got to explain how I'm going to do it, but that was, that was. You have, you have no time. Okay. So you've managed to talk for eight to nine minutes and you haven't said a single word. So is it uh, a big spring? Is it a big balloon? Or yep. is it uh, uh, those, uh, the, the ski lifts sending the rocks? That's energy cash, right? <laughs> that's right. And they're funded by, uh, Bill Gates as well, so you can talk to your, your, your Bill Gates about why he, why he funded that company. But can you tell us in uh, 30 seconds yeah, or less right. a little bit about your so, 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 so the, the answer is so light cell, the light cell energy is storing energy in the form of compressed air. Uh, basically we said, well, it's gotta be cheap. What is the cheapest possible storage medium? And the answer is air. It's not like we were the first to think of this. There have been previous attempts. The problem has been uh, that it's been it's been way too inefficient. It's not that it's been too expensive. It's not that it's you know it's 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 not that it's it hasn't been reliable. I mean, air compressors run for 20, 30 years in normal usage. They just aren't efficient. They return you know if if you could have an air compressor that ran forwards and backwards that could use the electricity that uses that runs the compressor to store air and then turn that air back into electricity. And air compressors don't work that way. But if you could, you'd maybe get 10 or 20 percent of the energy back. So that's not going to work. Our goal was to get to about 70%, and that required dealing with the heat that gets created when you really mean to comp get, uh, make compressed air. When you compress air, it gets hot, uh, and if you don't capture that heat and return it to the system, you've lost all that power, and that really is something like, like 60, 70% of the energy you put in ends up as waste heat if you get to high pressure. Uh, so we've, we've, we've dealt with that problem. Uh, we were founded in 2009, and we've been around for about three years. We have a 100 kilowatt scale prototype, uh, and uh, we are now working towards our you know, sort of megawatt scale. Uh, but always the, uh, you know, the goal is just get it so cheap uh, that it really can deliver power, uh, it, can be, it can deliver power at the grid parity. So we don't need business cases. It just becomes an orthodox part of the grid. Steve, can you, can you talk a little bit about the, I mean, we have entrepreneurs and, and people who are interested in funding. The company wasn't started, uh, the genesis of the firm was not originally as a grid scale energy storage company. Could you, would, sure. would you address the, that? Uh, actually, you could look at it and say, well, the low hanging fruit is actually in transportation. Because that's, you know, th that's all inefficient, Carbon creating uh, uh, power that's that's you know based on on liquid fuels and sure electric vehicles are great but you have to charge them from a grid that itself runs mostly from fossil fuels so uh, what we looked at were uh, and still perfectly possible with our technology were compressed air motors that could drive vehicles and uh, it's the same technology just at a different scale and when we went and talked to the venture capitalists they said. Yeah, transportation's nice, but then you have to build a whole car or a you know, small vehicle around it. Uh, you can get to where you want to go at grid scale much, much faster. And we went back, thought about, and decided they were probably right. So here we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Abe, you're next. Okay. Um, so next is uh, Abe Yokel. He's a partner at Rockport Capital, and I'll, I'll leave it to him to make his own introduction. You want me up there? Can I? Where are you comfortable? And you can harass me after I sit back down. Absolutely. Abe Yokel with Rockport. Uh, I walked in here today, and uh, Eric, the first thing he said to me was, oh, your nose looks a lot smaller in person than your picture. So, and then I've just heard from Jay that, uh, that investors aren't very uh, smart. So I've been told that I'm ugly and stupid already. So I, I hope this is enlightening for you tonight as well. Um, on that note. Uh, Rockport is a, is a stage agnostic venture fund. Um, we actually started out in 2000 uh, focusing on three areas, which we defined as energy and power, advanced materials, and process and prevention technologies. And about six or seven years ago, people started calling us a clean tech fund. Uh, we've never really called ourselves that. We started calling ourselves a clean tech fund. So we're a clean tech fund. Um, I think we still have the, or we now have, the largest in, uh, investment professional staff 
uh, that is purely dedicated to clean tech these days. We have 11, 11 partners uh, split between Boston and Menlo Park. I was in Boston for about four years with Rockport uh, and moved out here about five years ago to help us open up the office out here. Um, we are, uh, I mentioned we're stage agnostic. What that means for us is seed stage, we'll do 500K and smaller occasionally up through what we would consider late stage, uh, 15, 20 million dollars at a clip. We have about $850 million under management. We're investing out of a $450 million fund of which uh, we've deployed about two thirds. We're shooting for 30 investments out of that fund and we're at around 21 right now, I believe is the latest figure. Um, historically, we've made 50 investments in clean tech broadly defined to date. That includes everything from solar, smart grid, energy storage, which I'll talk about more today, wind, water, energy efficiency, smart grid, pretty much everything you would imagine with the exception of biofuels and biochemicals, uh, which we have not yet touched, although we continue to look at. Um, we are, on, on the energy storage spe piece specifically, we've made, I would say, four direct investments in energy storage companies, and, and one that Eric mentioned earlier is an ancillary investment. Um, only one of those is really broadly defined right now as something that would apply to grid scale. So we actually started out in a company called Nanogram Devices Corporation, uh, which was a silver, silver vanadium oxide for implantable medical devices. That actually got sold off pre-revenue to Wilson Great Batch, um, goes into medical devices that people stick in themselves or get stuck with. Um, we, we then moved on to a couple different uh, battery technologies and related technologies. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We seeded a company called Qnovo, which is all about battery management systems and the way that you charge and treat electrochemical systems. Uh, they're actually focused on lithium ion batteries and they're focused specifically on, on mobile and computing markets as a first market. And I'll come back to some of those use cases later. We also invested in a company called Inovix, which is a, sil a, a silicon ano anode battery um, that has a very different architecture for its battery, which uh, we believe uh, will enable 100% uh, silicon anodes to be commercialized. Those guys are doing very well. They're also out here in the Bay Area. And uh, I think this was mentioned earlier, we also have a, a fairly large investment in SustainX which is also an isothermal uh, compressed air energy storage company. So would be a, a direct technology competitor to LightSail. Um, I think uh, Jay said it earlier, we're not competing against each other. I tend to call these little technology fights in Silicon Valley and elsewhere a circular firing squad. It, it's not good for anybody. What we're really competing against is, uh, is the market use cases and as the case may be, uh, gas. Um, it's all about gas, particularly in the US, maybe not so much elsewhere in Europe. Um, so we've already heard a bunch of negative comments um, about the grid scale energy storage market. Venture and venture capitalists, thank you, Eric. <laughs> Wouldn't forget about that. Um, and you know, just kind of as an instructive thought, the way that we tend to think about things is we like companies that we don't have to invest too much money in, that have high margins and have fairly quick adoption. So now you're talking about <laughs> energy storage, lots of capex, long adoption cycles, and low margin. Sign me up, right? Um, and then you have the added benefit of, of uh, looking for bankability, particularly when you're dealing with uh, utility scale applications. Uh, a lot of these things are project financed, not all of them, but a lot of them are project financed. And that means that you need four years of operating data on an asset, if not more, for a totally new asset. Um, to actually be able to go to the project finance community and, and get something done. There are, and we'll come back to this later, there are a lot of good use cases for transmission deferral and the like, um, which Haresh is gonna talk to you about, I hope. He's written 170 pages on these kinds of applications. Um, so we have a couple minutes on that, I'm sure. Um, and the overriding piece of all this, of course, is the, the market use applications, uh, particularly for large scale energy storage, are all about cost. Um, so you've heard about water, air, and rocks today as energy storage, and this is only Silicon Valley can call water, air, and rocks technology. But this is kind of the cost that we have to talk about in a lot of ways uh, to get to, to uh, competitive grid scale energy storage. Um, so you may ask why we made these investments, and it's a good question, uh, but we really do believe uh, we have sight lines and we see a hairy path through, but it is a path through to get to real large scale companies that get to market quickly. Um, and the way we tend to think about things uh, is 
by market use cases, both by size, by technology, and by product iteration in those market use cases. We're talking mostly today about utility scale and grid scale energy storage. Uh, that is one use case. In general, it is the most cost sensitive use case. So what you're really talking about is trying to drive to the, one of the hardest adopting uh, markets with the most challenging cost barriers as a, as a first market. And we at Rockport, the way we think about this is you've got utility scale energy storage, you've got commercial industrial energy scale storage that may or may not bleed over to transportation energy storage. Then you have electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which may bleed into some of that commercial and industrial. Then you have residential, and then you have mobile. So mobile being all the smartphones that we all have out here in the crowd, um, and mobile computing. And when we look for investments, what we're really looking for is trying to tackle the highest value problems first. So if you look through our investment strategy in general, Qnovo and Novix uh, are both focused on, uh, on the mobile applications first. Both technologies, not those specific products, both technologies will apply to commercial, industrial, and probably EV uh, and, and transportation storage. Uh, and then eventually to the grid scale storage. Uh, SustainX and, and other similar approaches uh, can be applied and will eventually be applied to grid scale, but the reality is their first use cases will probably be uh, behind the meter, so not focused on utility in CNI sites uh, for people who have uh, significant demand charges, big manufacturing facilities, for example, or in areas where there are utility rate cases and, uh, and utility rates that benefit those who are willing to shift their, their um, usage to non-peak periods. And those really start out in the CNI rates in various places, at least around the US. So can you find interesting applications there? Can you find them overseas in off-grid areas or where they have bigger grid problems where people are paying to, uh, willing to pay more for your application? And then bring those out after you have the bankability data, after you have that kind of data, after you've driven your costs down and you can actually have a, a high margin business at the end of the day. Um, and if you are interested, Huresh has actually put together this incredible report that shows, you know, I think it's 10 different use cases um, uh, for various kinds of uh, monetizing your storage. And I think one of the big questions that, uh, that he and the market has brought up in general is, what is energy storage? Eric alluded to this earlier. Is it generation? Is it transmission and distribution? Uh, or is it behind the meter energy use cases like I was articulating earlier? And the answer is yes. But like, what, what do you do with that as a startup? Uh, there is no single market for energy storage. Uh, and the challenge for both investors and entrepreneurs in this is, is to find the path through, uh, find those use cases that are high value, and then migrate down to, to other use cases. And uh, I would be lying if I said it was easy, but uh, there are certainly those cases out there. Yeah. So, so Abe, you're, you're in the business of... Uh, Looking ugly. Hey! <laughs> this building, you're in the business of building great companies. Doesn't there seem to be a, a aspect ratio problem with his face there? Come on. <laughs> there we have it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, you're in the business of building great companies, but you're also in the business of exiting great companies, right? And yes, you build standalone companies that eventually become go public, but we have a moribund IPO market and a necrotic green tech IPO market. Who buys Qnova? Who buys Lightsail, Aquion? Um, th there is a, a little bit more of a vibrant M&A market in, in green tech. You, you have to consider this at some point in the life, li lifespan of a company or before you fund this company. Who buys one of these companies? Yeah, so it, this, is a, this is a fascinating question. And I think th turning it on its head a little bit is, will the public buy a profitable company? And the answer is yes. And the challenge right now is that a lot of the companies that took down a lot of capital historically have not yet shown those profitable business models. So, the public will buy them, so there's a public story there if you can build a quickly growing, profitable business. And a lot of these strategics out there, whether it's a GE, ABB, Schneider, will also buy a lot of these companies, um, some of which don't have to be profitable but are strategically important. So you know, the, the real thing that the venture community is looking for is the generation of growing and profitable businesses. Um, there are hype cycles in 
the venture business, and this applies to both clean tech and every other kind of tech. Um, and the challenge in venture, if you're, if you're really blunt about it, is you can find time, uh, you can find periods where the hype cycle is far in front of the business reality. And you can make money in those areas. Um, you can find times when the business reality is way behind the hype cycle, and you actually can't really make money in those areas. Um, and what you really get paid for in venture in some ways is being in the game when the hype cycle is on the way up and you've built profitable companies. And if you look at kind of the history of clean tech in the last six years, there was actually a great hype cycle building in 08. We were getting phenomenal paper results up through 08 as people threw money at many of the companies that we had invested in early. Um, and we weren't going to say no, but it makes for a challenging time when people start going out of the market and those same companies need to continue to raise money. And so after 2008, the hype cycle started kind of declining. People started running out of money that they had raised in kind of the 08, 07 time period. And today we find ourselves with some businesses that are growing nicely that are not yet showing these incredible profits that the public markets actually uh, reward but are growing nicely and have sight lines to those, mm -hmm. but the hype cycle is absolutely in the wrong direction. So the clean tech community is not gonna make money until companies that we invest in start making money, and as a result, the public markets, uh, as a start, uh, come back and start rewarding that growth and that profitability. Okay, thank you. I asked them a simple question. Who, who's going to buy these companies? And uh, he did give an answer. He mentioned the four horsemen of the smart grid, Siemens, ABB, GE, and Schneider, right? So those are some potential names. Um, Haresh, who you've heard about in whispered um, admiration for having written one of the seminal recent documents on energy storage. There's a, at least an executive summary that's available for free. I don't know, is the full, full encyclopedic document is out there as well uh, if you want to download it. And it's anybody interested in energy storage has either read it or has intentions of reading it. So um, please, Haresh, he's from EPRI. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I want to thank everybody. I'm Harish Kamath from EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, and uh, I've already been, um, uh, I've been lucky to get more plugs this evening than insults, uh, which not all of my panel members can uh, say. But um, I also have to say that it was many of my colleagues at EPRI who uh, also uh, participated in this report, and especially uh, my colleague Dan Rassler, who's the principal author on that report, and, I, and I'm very happy to have supported the uh, development of it, but it is available and we'll be talking about it. So um, just a, a moment to ask people here, um, because I'm assuming that this, this is a VLAB event. Most of the people here, raise your hand if you came here because energy storage may be a way for you to make money at some time in the future. Okay, that's a good number. How many people, wait, right, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. How many of those people want to make money in the next two years? Next, f next five years. Okay, all right, good. Uh, you have realistic expectations. <laughs> Um, we, we, you know, of course, and, and there's lots of, lots of things that uh, uh, can happen. There are lots of opportunities in the near term, but, uh, uh, you know, this is, as, as many of my panelists here, uh, my co-panelists here have said, is a long-term opportunity. Uh, we at EPRI, with Electric Power Research Institute, um, are a nonprofit, uh, independent research organization. We do public interest research in the energy and the, in energy and the environment. Uh, we are funded largely by the electric utilities, uh, but we are independent from them. So what we are paid to do is to do research to try to find out what the no BS answer is and provide that to the public, to the utilities, to um, the, the people who need to make decisions about it when it comes to electric power. And so I think I've been invited to this panel because uh, they figured I'd say something controversial. And I think all the controversial things have already been said. So, um, you know, I'll say them again. Uh, what we, but what we would like to say, what we'd like to do um, in the next few years is really, and, and our goal at EPRI, is to facilitate the development of real storage options uh, for the grid. Uh, there are lots of options out there. There are some storage things. And, and of course, there's pumped hydro, which has been around for a long time, and compressed air. There are some options like lithium ion, which have niche markets and uh, which, which have a possibility. But what we have not seen is a, there, there's a huge market for storage, billions of dollars 
uh, of markets for storage that do not have very solid technical solutions or economically feasible solutions to address those issues. And of course, you've already heard from two of my co-panelists who are developing technologies to address that. Uh, that's, and, and, and that's good. Uh, there's also a lot more to be done, however. In many, case, in many ways, uh, this industry is something where we've got all the ingredients in place, but what we don't have is a recipe. We don't have the way to actually put all this stuff together to make what we need uh, in, in, in storage. And of course, we've operated the grid for 100 years without storage, so it's a, it's a reasonable question to ask, why do we need this anyway? Uh, you know, as, as, uh, um, as Steve said earlier, the whole grid is a, like a giant just-in-time inventory system. It, we generate electricity and just the next moment it's transmitted all the way across the lines and it's uh, used in these lights in, in, uh, your, uh, uh, in your appliances and everything except your mobile appliances uh, because those mobile appliances run on batteries. And so that's the power of storage really right there. You've seen all of those things become possible because of storage. Just about every other commodity out there, whether it's um, just about anything, you know, gas or, or you know, sugar, um, even down to water or, or uh, you know, even data, there's some kind of storage. If you think about the cache that's in your uh, DVR, you know, that's, that's storage. That's the storage point at the end so that if you have an interruption, you can keep going smoothly without paying attention. But electricity doesn't have that buffer. And uh, the way that we get around that is by massive aggregation of sources uh, and massive overcapacity in the electricity uh, gener in the electricity enterprise. You heard uh, Mike say the question very early in this, you know, how many people have been in China? How many people have seen power outages? Uh, in most of the rest of the world, they don't, aren't as lucky to have the kind of grid that we have here where we can be guaranteed three nines or in many cases, five nines of reliability. Uh, and in those places, a buffer or storage can be very handy. Even in the grid that we have here, we're not necessarily going to have the same uh, infrastructure in the future that we have today. Uh, today, most of our power still comes from highly controllable sources. So it's not quite accurate to say that we don't have storage on the grid. It's just that the energy is stored before it gets converted to electricity rather than after it gets converted to electricity. However, with renewable energy like wind and solar, we don't have that option. We have to generate the electricity first and then store it. And that's really where the opportunity for storage comes. Uh, it's generally accepted, all the utilities will agree that energy storage is a great idea. It, it, it works, it, it's a, uh, in principle, it's very, uh, very simple and, and uh, a very compelling idea. The, uh, the real obstacles, however, from a technical standpoint are how do we make this economically viable, either from the benefit standpoint, we've never used this technology before and are not substantially used it before. Uh, even pumped hydro is only 2.5% of the grid here in the US, so it's a very small part of the grid. So utilities need to find ways in which they can bring value to make it make sense. And on the other hand, they've got to have cost-effective options. And those cost-effective options have to include everything. You can't just bring a piece of meat to a guy and say, here, eat this. You gotta cook it, you, gotta, you have to present it, you have to plate it, and, and then you know, it looks palatable. A lot of people complain that the utilities aren't just buying the solutions that are available out there, but the problem is that it has not been uh, prepared in a way that is a whole product solution. So what we're looking for in this area is not just the underlying technology. We're really looking for an ecosystem of partners that can work together with utilities, with the ISOs, with the other users of storage, and with the end consumers to really create a new infrastructure that incorporates storage in a way that makes the grid more affordable, more reliable, more environmentally sustainable for the future. So I, 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 I don't uh, do it often, but I, I want to ask a, like a reporter kind of question. Um, you're a 501c3, right? Which means you're a That's charitable organization, right? Yep. Um, do, you, do you have a receipt? Do you have a receipt? <laughs> but we are the only, I think we're the only nonprofit on the stage, which means, of course, conversely, we're making money in this business. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> these are nonprofits. They're nonprofits. They're nonprofits as well. Um, well, I should say not for profit. Okay. <laughs> we're um, not for profit. Um, but you are funded to a great extent by the utility 
ecosystem, right? Yeah, that is and correct. To the tune of something like three hundred million dollars. We're about three hundred fifty million dollars. Three hundred fifty million dollars. So, despite your charitable nomenclature, um, your board is composed of utility executives. That is absolutely and correct. And so you do see the world through a utility lens. We're, we're very, we, we, you can say that, you know, of course, again, we have, we're very uh, careful to maintain our scientific independence and, and uh, um, our, our academic freedom in that way. But yes, our funding comes from the utilities and we have close ties to the utilities because they are our advisors. They tell us what's required for electric power, and uh, uh, we try to address those from a technical standpoint. Okay. But again, the long-term interest in any industry is to have people who can tell you what's for real and not just what you want to hear. That's why utilities come to us. They pay us to do that work instead of hiring a consultant who will just tell them what they want to hear. Okay. Um, so you, you started talking a little bit about making money in energy storage in, in, two, in, the, in the next two years. Um, when do you think the first, and I'll, I'll address this to the rest of the, 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 the panel, when is the first gigawatt of electrochemical or next generation energy storage deployed in the United States? When do we get past the one, we recently, I think, um, got past that number in California in solar. When do mm -hmm. we get our first gigawatt the first gigawatt is the hardest, right? When do right. we get past this? When do we get this first gigawatt? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, and, and obviously, it's going to depend on a lot of things. It uh, depends on not just the technical aspects of, you know, do we have the right technology for this, but also the economic aspects of, you know, how low cost is it, and finally, and the regulatory aspects. You know, are we going to have the right regulatory structure? Um, one of the things you see with solar and wind is that you can drive that kind of that kind of adoption if you really want to. If you say it's a public good and you put the right regulatory structures in place. Um, you know, it's, that's, that's whether you determine that's a good or not. Um, and in storage, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So you can't just say, um, well, you can, but uh, it's, it's more difficult to say that, that storage is an unalloyed good for society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Thank you, Haresh, thank you. Thanks. So Abe, I would assume that you're going to uh, expect your companies to graduate within the life of your fund, right? Absolutely. Right? So would you say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would you say um, that energy storage is going to be a commercial viable choice for utilities in the next five years, in this, in this uh, decade? So in certain use cases, yes. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. and, and this, is, this is the key. When I said earlier, technology matched with product matched with use case, will they be deploying it for mass scale energy storage? I don't think so. Will they be deploying it for transmission deferral and in, occasionally for ancillary services in five years? I think so. And right. so uh, it doesn't take that much to move the needle on, on, uh, on a, a venture backed startup's top line if utilities actually start deploying these things. So, so Steve, on your website, I think T&D deferral is mentioned as one of the primary commercial applications. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what the heck T&D deferral is and why you can make <coughs> money from that and how a utility can monetize that? Ah, well, uh, T&D deferral is a transmission and distribution. So that's, in many cases, the most expensive part of the grid is not the generation. Uh, but the getting the electrons to the end, the end user, and that's especially expensive in dense urban areas. Uh, in fact, there, there are some, some cases um, uh, where there's, there's a, a literal T&D deferral revenue stream that you could realize uh, where somebody has got to beef up the capacity uh, you know, the transmission capacity to a particular area, you know, some, some, some place that's growing. Uh, and it's going to cost them a certain amount of money to put in those, those new wires. And instead, they could, you know, spend that much or less money on storage, where you put the storage, say, at an existing substation, you fill it up at night. When the, when the demand gets higher, you supply it right, you know, locally out of, this, out of the substation. Uh, and that way you could defer or permanently eliminate the need for that, that particular T&D upgrade. In many cases, it's much more indirect, uh, where you've got, uh, you know, uh, you're adding capacity somewhere, you also have to add some lines, that's an Whoa. increase to the, it, 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 it can be very complicated, but that's, 
the basic idea. OK. All right. Well, but um, if I'm a utility, I want to build wires. I, it's my, that's my, one of my assets. I get paid on that. I can just pass the, uh, the, the costs on to you, the ratepayers. And uh, life is good for me as a utility. So why, why should I have to make, even make that, that, well, that decision? Part, part of it is that it often takes a really long time to put more wires in. I think it's, you know, several years is typical. Uh, whereas you could, you know, if, if the energy storage uh, system is, uh, is built into a shipping container, you can, you know, drop it in there, hook it up, and be, be going in a, in a, you know, in a matter of days. All right. uh, and so that's the, you know, and then if it's working well, you know, why put in the wires? Why go to all those, you know, uh, meetings and whatnot where you have to do that? Okay. No, no environmental impact uh, studies and things like that. Jay, um, when do you ship your first megawatt, or when does anybody ship their first megawatt to a commercial energy storage application. There was 120 megawatts shipped of energy storage in 20, deployed in 2010, but to the great extent there, uh, pilot programs, demonstration programs, ARA, ARA kind of stimulus fund stuff. North America or globally? I'll take globally. I'd well, I mean, NGK has shipped, you know. Hundreds of megawatts? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So th it's done. Um, okay. Of course, they've had some issues. Um, well, no, they, they've done it, right? I'm, I'm not, sure. say, I'm not sure. saying that the problems are over, but it has been accomplished, right? So, um, so, I'm, I, so the answer is it's already it's been happened. done. So, yeah. I, I want to talk a tiny bit about utilities. You know, um, one of the gentlemen I, I, at PG&E, his name is John Eric Thalman. He's in charge, or was in charge of a, a demonstration, a battery demonstration, and the the utility had to pick a technology with which to do this multi-megawatt demonstration or megawatt hour demonstration, and they picked NGK mm -hmm. sodium sulfur batteries because utilities are risk averse. And they're going to go with something, as, as Abe talked about, at least they could show four years of, of field data, whereas no other advanced energy te uh, storage technology can. And so it was, <laughs> OK. So. Um, I have one question, and then we're going to go to the audience questions, OK? Um, I, I don't know if you heard, but uh, there's going to be some wholesale personnel changes in the Obama administration, right? Hillary's probably leaving. Uh, I, I think General Petraeus might be leaving. <laughs> um, uh, Leon Panetta, I think, is also leaving. And Steve Chu is also there speaking of him not take, keeping the DOE post. Um, and I, I, just got a, I just got some email that a couple of people are being considered, like um, Jim Rogers from, from Duke Energy, Steve Wesley's name has been mentioned in a, in a few. Um, who's the, in fact, he's Stanford uh, connected, the, the CEO of Farallon? Dan, Dan Riker. Uh, well, Dan Riker's name was mentioned, and the, the, the gentleman who founded Farallon. That's right. Um, was also mentioned. And in this list, also mentioned as potential DOE heads are Jay Whitaker, Steve Crane, Abe Okel, and Haresh Kamath. So congratulations. Um, Jay, what do you do after you've read your acceptance speech? You're now the, 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 the secretary of the DOE. What do you do to advance? And you have, uh, you have an axe to grind. You want energy storage in the world. How do you, how do you change? What, what do you do from a, 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 a national agenda to make energy storage happen? You know, it's amusing. I'm a professor of policy at halftime. And this is a question always that I ask my students. I have never been asked it myself. <laughs> okay. um, By the way, don't Twitter anything I just said, because most of it is just made up, you know? So don't. <laughs> I, I, I will not be secretary of the Department of Energy. Well, what do I do exactly? What's your first day on the job? You're the ener energy storage guru, and you're going to make the world safe for energy storage. What do you do? What can you do from a, uh, your bully pulpit, from a legislative direction? From what can you, how can you influence energy storage adoption? Um, I think that the, the, the right way to do this, I don't believe, is to distribute a lot of funding to a lot of individual research projects or demonstrations. I think you'd rather focus on evolving uniform legislation that allows the valuation of storage to be compared and a market generated that is reasonable across the North American market because it's not consistent right now. And until we have a consistent market for storage, nothing else really will happen. Yeah. So right? This interview so. went pretty well. You, is there anything in the past I need to know about <laughs> before we go to the next step? Huh. 
I have to leave now. OK. Um, Steve. Uh, well, once again, I have, to, I have to pretty much agree with Jay. The, 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 the real thing is you want to, the, the key thing is you want a level playing field. Uh, you want to make it possible for uh, the, you know, energy storage to demonstrate its value in a way that actually makes sense. And that's a, it, you'd be surprised how hard it is to figure out, you know, this little piece in, the, in a larger puzzle, uh, how much it's actually worth. But I'll just add, too, that energy storage by itself doesn't really fix much of anything. It can maybe make, you know, uh, you could reduce the amount of, uh, of, of, of peak power that you supply, generate more power base load with, say, nuclear, and then use energy storage to, uh, to, to, to manage the load. Uh, but really, to, to, to really make an impact, uh, you, you, need to, you need to find a way to add more renewables. Uh, and that's, that is research that I would, I would you know, make some, some investment in. It will take a while to pay off, but uh, it, there's, there's a lot of good work being done there, and it could use some more support. Abe, can we, can we pull you out of the world of venture capital mm -hmm. into Washington, D.C.? Probably not, but I'll still answer. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I have two, two answers to that. The first is, as many of you are probably aware, States control their public utility commissions, which control utilities. And so what you end up with in the US is 50 different markets, effectively, and 50 different regulators, each with their own IOUs that they're dealing with, which are their own markets. This isn't true in every state, but that is generally true. So you have hundreds or thousands of different markets. As an entrepreneur trying to serve those individual markets with a technology distilled into a product meant for a use case, there's no uniformity in use cases. So my, my made up story would be to, uh, similar to what the US did with the highway administration, I've forgotten when, because I don't actually know, um, uh, allow the FERC and empower the FERC to actually be able to push down regulation uh, in some way with some kind of incentive, like pulling highway funds, um, to state level public utility commissions to some level. So that's number one. And number two, um, the U.S. has never, in the recent history of the U.S., had a long-term energy plan. It's all over the map. Um, and focusing the U.S. on a long-term energy plan in combination with allowing for some amount of uniformity across the states would do a tremendous amount for the country as well as for the energy storage market. Okay. Anything you'd like to tell me that's, you know... Should I ask my mistress? <laughs> hey! <laughs> um, just, yeah, whatever. Um, Haresh. So um, I'm gonna, first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be careful with this question, because uh, as, as EPRI, we are actually not allowed to advocate on, on uh, uh, any kind of policy things. So what I, would, what I would point out, though, uh, in, 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 what am I, what am I, in, in what my co-panelists co have said, a lot of this is not something that uh, the executive branch can just step in and and do right. I mean, a, a lot of what they're talking That's about are comprehensive question, I know. Uh, solutions that you know a lot of legislators and, and other people would have to uh, act on. It's not something that a uh, is that the Stephen Chu can come and decree or or whoever Stephen Chu's successor is could come in and decree that there will be storage. Um, if if uh, if I might say though, I mean it's possible to think that it, we would maybe get better research results if uh, there was a long-term plan um, in uh, uh, in in storage or in in any area of energy uh, rather than uh, what we rather than a process that is politically motivated. So uh, you know, I mean it's it's it, those things have to be considered in in any kind of uh, policy discussion. Okay, that was a. Uh pivot, uh, that's called that question, that answer is kind of a pivot, not answering the question I asked. Um, <laughs> okay, we have questions from the audience. We're going to go for another 15 minutes, and I'll try to make them fast. You know, we have a doctor and a doctor. There's a question here that says, do I have to have a PhD to work in energy storage? So you've hired 100 people. How many people are, are, are PhDs? Two. Two, okay. Quite a few, about 10 or 11 out, okay. of, out, of, out of 50. We, we fired one of ours. <laughs> <laughs> Abe, I'm going to skip you. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we uh, I don't think PH, uh, well, I don't have a PhD, so I'll say uh, uh, you don't have to have a PhD to work in storage. I'm, I'm living proof. Okay. Um, 
for all, can energy storage coupled with solar be popular in the developing world, for example, um, in India or areas where there's either a weak or just a stupid grid? Uh, Anybody uh, want to take that? I can. I can. Uh, so, solar and energy storage. Is, yeah, is there I, an I economic think, case for You know, me? a number of years ago, I, I was in India and uh, uh, I actually witnessed a lot of people putting out solar. And in the same in the same way that you know, cell phones have allowed people to kind of leapfrog the traditional telephone in um, uh, in a lot of developing countries in Africa and India and and other parts of the world. Uh, in the same way, you know, solar infrastructure can allow people to leapfrog the necessity for the grid. Uh, the only problem with that is that, you know, what, what's the first thing you want with electricity generation, right? The first thing you want is a light at night, and that's the one time you don't have the solar. So uh, just about the first thing that you do in any solar deployment of that sort is put a, some kind of battery on there. And of course, the lowest cost battery available today is the lead acid yes. battery. Um, if you had, which is a very short-lived battery, and, and that actually by itself is just the lead acid battery that at that time was destroying the value proposition. It wasn't the solar panel. This was 10 years ago. I mean, the solar panels were expensive, but the solar panels were okay. They, they could make those pay for themselves, but the battery had to be replaced every two years, and that destroyed your, uh, your, your business case. So um, now, you know, fast forward to today, it, we have better lead acid batteries, but they're still not good enough to actually do uh, a very long-term investment. And, and if, if somebody in a village wanted to buy power, they'd need something that lasted more than two years. They'd need something that lasted uh, six or seven years. And lead acid, I don't think, reliably can achieve that. So if you have something that's a low-cost battery that can give you a very good cycle life and is reasonably energy dense, it doesn't have to be very energy dense for that. Oh. Yeah, I, I got that. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, it can be, uh, you know, it, it's, got, it's got a definite potential there. It's true. We have a CEO in the audience. I'm not going to embarrass him too much, uh, Steve Bissett, who is the CEO of uh, TerraJoule, who is doing a solar um, energy storage uh, hybrid. And uh, he also has some um, both real photographs as well as artist's renderings that he can show you. Um, <laughs> So it's, this is a great question, but this is not really appropriate for the lightning round. We only have a few questions to go. But what's the bottom line for energy storage? How much would a grid with storage save for us? And Haresh, you were talking a little bit about this societal value. What's the value? Is it just the cost of a few gas power plants for a state like California? Is that, is that all we're saving, is eliminating a couple of, 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 gas, of gas fired plants? And I want to add one piece of information. This is something from the mouth of, uh, well, a couple of people. But any, anytime you're there, natural gas can do almost anything that energy storage does. And natural gas and demand response can do everything that energy storage does. So do you need to see natural gas return to uh, $6 per million BTUs before energy storage can become realistic? Is there, where is the, what's that number? Uh, yeah, it's pretty tough at uh, three dollars a million BTU uh, to, to, to to justify energy storage versus a gas peaker. Gas peaker plants are pretty cheap. What's really expensive is the fuel, but at three bucks a million BTU, forget it. But remember, it isn't three bucks. Uh, it hasn't been three bucks uh, for very long, and it won't can, won't be. I don't think anybody thinks that's a sustainable price. And in much you know, in, in Europe, it's twelve bucks or more. In Japan, it can be sixteen dollars. So by the time that all levels out, it's probably seven or eight bucks. And then, yeah, energy storage can be very competitive. Okay. Well, let me, uh, if I might, say something there. Um, yeah, I agree with the you know with the analysis there that uh, that Steve presented. I mean, we we don't. In fact, we believe that the price of gas is likely to go up. Uh, in the future, and the, the and levels at where we are today, the two and a half to three dollars a MBTU are just unsustainable. But you know, I'd also like to add that you know, as I said earlier, a lot of the uses and the values of energy storage go beyond just what we're replacing, right? It's not. It's as if you were to say, well, you know, what are we saving by getting an iPad? We're just saving all those magazines, right? That you don't have to buy anymore, right? That's that's all you're doing. Uh, you know, it's a lot more. I mean, that's that 
that technology is, is certainly replacing what was there before. But there's a very good likelihood that you can do all kinds of things with storage on the grid that you couldn't do without it. Uh, because it really transforms the nature of the grid. It makes things uh, very different than, than what it was before. So you can't simply just take a, uh, a technology and say, oh, well, you know, this is just an, an equivalency, one versus the other. Uh, let's just take all of, uh, you, you know, the only thing you do with storage is replace all of the gas turbines on the grid. Uh, it's really uh, the potential to do much more. We just have to investigate that. That really does take a lot more work to figure out exactly what we can do with storage. And of course, we have to have some of the cost-effective options to make that possible. Okay, this is specifically for a light sale. Um, what's the target physical size of the storage container, and what's the ideal application? Also, what do you think about PG&E's 300 megawatt compressed air energy storage project in Bakersfield? Is that 300 megawatts or, or 25? 25 megawatts, but uh, 300, maybe it's 300, 300 megawatt hours. Okay. It's it okay. possible. Uh, sorry, first part of the question again. So, what is the tar so you're using a sort of a standard large container size? What yeah. is that standard large it, container? It, it's well, a 40 foot container should hold, uh, and this we are definitely in the artist rendering stage here. Our, our current tanks are about this big. Uh, it will hold about a megawatt hour. So, figure one full size storage container is is a megawatt hour. Uh, similar to uh, you know to, to Jay, we haven't really been trying to optimize uh, energy density. We could probably get to half that size by compressing the air to a higher pressure, but that would add more cost and and uh, and probably reduce the efficiency a bit. Um, and and uh, when you go to PG&E, do you say stop that foolishness of digging this hole in the ground and, and buy 300 of my of my of my things? Uh, no, nothing wrong with digging a hole in the ground. Uh, it it it's. Uh, you know, underground air storage is, is a very inexpensive way to do it at large volumes. What, what they haven't yet figured out is how to do the compression and the expansion part, the part that actually delivers the energy uh, efficiently. And uh, they, you know, they, they, they really need to do that because otherwise the economics just don't work. Okay. Um, you know, I think we should wrap it up, um, okay? So you can swarm these guys uh, after we're done. But I want, I, you, in 25 words or less, do you have some words to, budding entrepreneurs, um, grizzled C storage CEOs in the audience on how to persevere, what to look for, what, the, what, what, what are your, your farewell words to this audience? I already gave my advice. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, I just say solve, concentrate on the problem, solve the right problem, and the problem is making energy storage so cheap that it can transform the grid in the way Harish is talking about. Abe, to entrepreneurs in the audience? The focus on the end use application and uh, don't need to raise a lot of money. Harish? Yeah, it all comes down to the uh, value proposition. You know, utilities love energy storage. You, you know, people say they don't, they're afraid to try it. Yes, they're shy. They're very shy, but they have a crush on energy storage. Uh, you just have to approach it the right way and you have to make sure that you're in for the long haul. All right. So. First of all, thanks to you for coming out tonight. Thanks for the audit to, to this panel, this great panel. We'll have some last words, but um, first, thank you.